This video will make many people hate me, but my reputation precedes me always. So I apologize in advance. But my dear African pastors, please minimize what you copy from the West. It is not helping the Christian community here in Africa. Let's get into the video. And today we are talking about the person of Pastor David Ibiome. Have been trending for his statement about Adam and the Garden of Eden. Please listen to this, my dear friends. The kingdom you and I belong to knows no poverty. Poverty is not in his kingdom. If heaven is where you came from, then there should be a reflection of heaven in your life. Are you getting me now? And he said, the streets of heaven are paved with gold. Are paved what? So there's no poverty in heaven. Poverty is an anatomy in heaven. Now, let me say this to you to humble you. If you don't want to prosper, they are not ready for heaven. Because he said, the streets of heaven, don't be holier than God. So if you say, I don't like, I don't like to be rich, I don't like to be wealthy, then you are saying, I don't like to go to heaven. Because your heaven where you're coming from, your country where you're coming from, there's no poverty. In the Garden of Eden, there was no day Adam prayed for wealth. Adam was stupendously wealthy. He did not build from a pool. He had pools all over. Adam did not want to say, Jesus' name, I need breakthrough. He was inside breakthrough. Adam was so wealthy that there was no prayer request of any need. But he mismanaged it. He did what? He mismanaged it. Adam mismanaged what God gave to him. He said, take everything here. All is your own. Take it. These are the rules. These are the what? The rules. And then Adam just all of a sudden mismanaged what God gave to him. And God says, since you have mismanaged it, give it back to me. I collect it from you. Every time you mismanage what God gives to you, he takes it back. Now, God said to him, he said, Adam, <laughs> the whole of everything here is your own. But I'm giving you an order. Don't touch this fruit. I feel like I need to point this out. If you read Genesis 2 verse 15 when the Lord gave the command, actually, God said you can eat of every fruit here except that of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He didn't say you shouldn't touch it because he was supposed to take care. So he could touch it, but he couldn't eat it. You get to really understand this if you think deeper to understand that when God gave this command to Adam, Eve wasn't there. But when Eve was created out of Adam, Adam passing that instruction that God gave him to Eve, note, if you read the scriptures carefully, the first person to start a conversation about this tree was the serpent. The serpent must have observed something to say, Ah, did God really say you shouldn't eat of any fruit that is in the garden? The serpent wasn't even specific about that particular fruit. It was now Eve that said, of course, we can eat of any fruit in the garden. But God specifically instructed that we shouldn't eat of the fruit in the middle of the garden. But God specifically instructed we shouldn't eat of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden or even touch it. If you do, you will die. God didn't talk about touching it. So, how Adam communicated instructively to Eve what God had commanded him as the one that is the sole person entrusted. Of course, that's why men are the head. Feminists will start arguing now. Communicating it to Eve had a more stringent approach to it. Don't even touch it. So already, Eve was not even feeling free, probably, to even go around that tree. 
so the serpent has something to even capitalize on so i would think i'm just giving more like you know a bit of a teaching now before we get into the meat if eve could touch that tree or the fruit of a tree and nothing happened then it was easier for eve to even eat of it just a little bit of a background here but let's go on to the cocoa is that clear sir he said, manage everything in this garden, but this one is mine. The earth and its fullness thereof belongs to God. But God never said, according to the scriptures, oh, manage everything, but this one, na me get them. No be so you talk, I'm shabby. No be so you there for Bible. But let's see where he's getting to. Don't touch it. But Adam mismanaged it by touching what he was asked not to touch. In the kingdom of God, we live by laws. We live by what? Laws are simple principles. When you are lawless, you'll be lifeless. The coming of Jesus did not break. He only broke the laws of the altar, but not the Bible is a book of laws. The book of what? Laws are simple principles. Can you commit sin now and go to heaven? Can you say that is removed from the Bible? Is there no more heaven? Is there no more hell? Now, God is simply saying, this is my law to you, Adam. Take everything here, but this one, don't what? Don't touch it. You all know the story. Is that not true? <laughs> Glory to God. When Adam touched it, God said, you mean Adam, you touched it? What is it that Adam touched? I'm going somewhere. And, uh, no, 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 no. Now listen. If it was apple, by symbolic illustration, then you should and you and I should not eat apple again. True? If it was adultery, it was only one woman, so there wouldn't have been anywhere to commit adultery. So what is it that Adam did? What was the sin he committed? Because you need to ask questions. That God will get so angry as Adam, you mean you committed this sin? Get out here. Did he commit adultery? He did not eat apple. It's not apple Adam ate, please. <laughs> you get up so far. Well, after all, you, you, should, you shouldn't be eating apple again. That means after you eat apple, you already committed sin. And that's some of you ate apple yesterday. <laughs> Adam touched the tight. And I did what? The tithe was the only thing God told him not to touch. He said, this one is yours, but this is mine. And, 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 Don't touch it. So every time you touch your tithe, you are living in dishonesty. You are living in what? You are tampering with that which God has told you not to touch. Many Christians are not honest with their titan. Everything in this video is allegedly. Are you hearing me? They, they touch it today. They say, God, forgive me. Now listen. Every time you willfully disobey God, there's a consequence. There's a what? He sent Jesus to redeem mankind, but he sent Adam out. He may forgive you, but he may lead you to poverty. And, 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 and. Now, I took my time to listen to that. I, I, I tried to really make myself think that he was taken out of context. But indeed, he was speaking in context. Now, I will try to really, in my best possible way, try to um, defend his statement and how he's trying to sound, even though in no way is he correct in what he's saying. Now, of course, I've seen a video that has been trending by Pastor Robert Dabina, even though he wasn't speaking directly to him, but on a particular occasion where he attended a program and someone preached the same thing. Remember I told you guys in my previous video that there's literally nothing actually new under this sun with respect to doctrines you see flying in here and controversial. Pastor David Ibiyeme is not the first person that has ever preached that, even though this is actually more recent. So 
that particular video by Ebo Damina, I think is going to be doing justice as well to this particular converse conversation. Even though I still have an issue with something as well Ebo Damina said with respect to the Garden of Eden again in this video. So it's going to be kind of like packed. If you are in for the conversation, relax. One, now you have gotten the prelude. One, wait after the intro. Welcome back. So now let's start the discussion properly. When I took time to listen to Pastor David e. Biyom, I was just asking myself a question. Even your church name is Salvation Ministry. I think at this point it should be changed to Titan Ministry. Just an opinion. Probably you understand, but that's just me making a joke. But just to be on a serious ground, many of the times videos trend about him. It's about like the prosperity gospel, Titan. When it comes to the Titan doctrine, he, he many of just search titing his name you see lots and lots of videos as well when, when it comes to how he gets to enforce it now he has gone so back to the point that he's now gone as far back as even the garden of eden to talk about titing with respect to what adam himself did as his own sin i'll try to really explain to you what i think he's thinking even though what he's thinking is not correct. But we have to look at scriptures in this particular context. Before we get there, what he's saying categorically is not in the Bible, just for you to know. So him saying that, at least those who are his followers, if you are watching, don't wait till five years, six years from now when he comes to apologize. You know now that what he said is not true. It's not biblical. What he's saying is his own interpretation of trying to really enforce or what i say make you see the need for tithing so tithing itself is not what led to the fall of man now i know the whole idea of apple the, the, the scripture didn't say apple categorically it says fruit now i know what about amina says about that particular aspect as well but we'll get on to that towards the end of the video let's address the whole pastor david be your situation because i wonder to myself if tithing is so important to god like he actually makes it i think it should also be part of the ten commandments at least under the law. Don't you think so? But even in the context of scripture as well, you and I know, based on scripture, that Adam wasn't the one that was deceived, even though he doesn't talk about the deception. So he said that Adam ate his tithe. Now think of it for a moment. If you look at the three kinds of tithes that exist in the Bible, at least from Deuteronomy, there's actually a particular tithe that you actually have to eat. You know, we have the one, of course, of the Levite, the one that is also for the poor. Then we have a tithe of the feast that actually has to be eaten. So in that particular context, looking at the principle of tithing, if we get to follow tithing for what tithing itself was in scripture under the law, you are still wrong if I have to try to defend you on that. But if you are saying that Adam ate his tithe, that means the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the scripture was 10% of the other trees that God had made. How do you know the tree? is 10% of all the trees that were created in the garden. Think about that because one tenth has to be out of a particular lump sum, like how you tithe today. If you get a hundred, probably you tithe 10. So how do you know that in scripture that that particular tree is 10%? That is number one. Now remember I said I'm also trying to defend Pastor David Ibiome. So on the defense side, if I'm looking at how he looks at it, of course, I'm going to play for you where this particular teaching originated from, in my opinion. I know how to dig up stuff. Come on, this is something I do. If you are looking at it from the angle of provision, that God provides for you, and then understanding God's provision for us, we give God 10%. Now, let's look at it, of course, in the context of the garden. So, if God provided all the trees and said, don't eat of this one, and that particular one actually is is tight. That means should be, so just that means God provides a source of livelihood for us, different from other streams of income or source of livelihood we have, and says this particular one, it's actually for me, not as if you actually bring ten percent from your main source of livelihood or only source of livelihood to God, but God has to provide. A source of livelihood different from other source of livelihood you have and say this particular one now me get them you see this is me trying to defend this particular aspect but again it doesn't get to click because I have to look at it as well following it logically God provided everything and said this one 
do not eat of it that means god if you are using tithing from adam is supposed to provide for us believers a source of life that means all of us are supposed to have at least multiple streams of income and then this particular stream of income god says everything from this particular stream of income should actually be for me because that is my tithe i don't know if you understand but again does it really get to add up you see i'm trying my dear friends salvation ministry members no vex for me but let's go on but i don't think you actually remember the scriptures too well so let me try to i'm not correcting you sir if you are watching this i'm making these videos for your followers who will be watching this video you have to understand something that at the center of the garden there was one tree called the tree of life and at the same time at the same center the tree of knowledge of good and evil or some would say knowledge of good and bad that is something very significant which is also important in this conversation because you have to really understand where i'm getting to with this so if you are looking at the fact that adam eating the fruit is him actually eating his tithe. I trying to say that Adam, even though he wasn't the one that was deceived, like we know in scripture in Timothy, that Adam should have presented the tree, the same tree that God told him not to eat of to God. Do you understand? Even though he was supposed to eat of every other tree except that one, but in your mind, he ate of that which he was supposed to give to God. You see, your argument does not make sense even if I try to defend you in any way. But I get the point you are trying to make in a sense just that, you know, because your mind is so skewed with money, money to a great extent, which I would have to play this video in a defense for you because it's still your voice. At least those who will be lambasting you in the comment, they will know that somewhere, somehow you know the truth, but just that sometimes probably because of some things you also want to um, achieve or make happen in the church, that's what motivates you to preach this kind of message because please my dear audience listen to this the church has left our primary assignment thank god is a prosperous church but please prosperity without this you miss it when everything about your brain is only money 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 you're off track people are no longer interested in seeking for us the kingdom of god what people are after lord i need god lord i need house lord i need good life not bad we say what shall it profit a man if he can't do a world and this is so prosperity is very deadly and very good you hear me every time you're prosperous put yourself on that check you know why check the last time you ever misbehaved when, when you had money both male and female any money that would destroy you and i we would never have it seek you first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and everything shall be what's are here Oh yes, yeah. some of you are surprised he can actually preach like that. Oh oh yes, yeah. so he, he knows the truth of scripture. It's not as if he doesn't know. They know. Just that when the highlights of this gets to come, you, you don't know what might be going in going on in the ministry that would make you know him come out and make that kind of statement. He recently gave uh, Pastor uh, he recently gave Bishop David Iwidipu a Rolls Royce. Do you know what how much that cost? It's not small money, I would say. Some of you would say that oh with his branches and all that, of course it's easy to make that kind of money and then but it's not an easy seed that he has sown. You see, you shouldn't even be caring how he's going to get it back. Probably one way that covers his getting it back might be you sowing into the ministry or those who would just be giving, you know, violently to him because, of course, he's a fertile ground, like he said in this particular video. If you give to a pastor that does not give, your heavens will close. You hear me? It's not everywhere you put offering. Many of you, you say you gave to me, you get blessed through. You know why? I'm a very dangerous giver. I'm a very fatal ground. If you give to a non-giver, you will never give me money without humility. Immediately, bah, you pay through because I am a giver. Don't give to a non-giver. Especially when the person is born. Again. If the person is like, let him be crying. Leave him to sort his arms out with God. Someone say prosperity preachers. I said before, will I teach poverty? I'm a prosperity preacher. Let them say the person is correct. I don't know if you understand, but again, the things it's one thing for you to just, you know, preach your principles. But when you try to use the Bible as well to justify that, it, it makes Christianity itself look like a, a, a child. It looks like a joke. Because what you are saying now as well, even if you had, even if you say that it's not Apple, it, come on, the scripture you didn't say Apple. And if you are now coming to say this and now bring tight into there, like how does it even, how does it even align? That means tithing is not even a problem. It's not even something that will. People always say, oh, start from Abraham and Mesik, make said that you have taken it as far back to Adam and Eve. Ah, Oga, okay. hey, Joe. But if you have to look, okay, if you have to even look at tithing itself, at least you are claimed and even said correctly that he was in charge. He was a caretaker. You understand? He was 
taking control of everything. He didn't have to like go through like the labor of like working for this or working for that. God made provision for everything. He was just to, you know, make sure everything of course is in order as a person that has been placed charge of everything. But if you look at the concept of tithing itself, it is from your harvest that you also, so what kind of work was, who was he working for? What kind of business was he doing as well? At least if you are, if I'm going to follow your ideology on that, it still boils down to the main fact that tithing had never, ever in scripture been money. It had always been livestock. It has always been food. It has always, always been the agro. It, it, has, it has always been agriculture itself. So at least where is the money now coming from? Because today we are talking about money. But some of you don't want to have that conversation, of course. <laughs> I know for a fact. So you see, trying to defend you, I'm just like, where, where do I even go to in this whole thing? Because it's very difficult to defend you at this point. Probably your members would do a good job as well doing so. Because I saw people writing, I was wondering, what are they even writing? Because are they really listening? Probably as well, we might expect an apology in the next five, six, seven years. But at least, at least people now, their eyes are opening to the fact that some of these things are just non far. Like Pastor Ia Debo, you see about one of his pastors that was preaching something else entirely. Very, very shallow, I would say. So let's note this for a fact. God himself did not ask Adam to pay anything. You know, if, if you are saying that Adam fell because of tithe, that means there was actually a requirement placed on him. You cannot be charged for something that you don't even know of. I don't know if you understand, because even when Abraham gave a sword to Melchizedek, more like a shadow of Jesus, it was not a command. It was something he did willingly as well, which should also be the guide for giving if you are supposed to apply giving as for what it actually should be. I don't know if you get the point of what I'm saying. So at this point as well here, it still makes no sense because there's no demand of God saying that you should. The demand that God actually placed on him was that of all of these trees you can eat, but except of this one, because when you eat it, you shall surely die. So let's look at um, so let's look at Abel Damina's rebuttal, of course, as it has been trending, because it's as if Abel Damina is placed on the pedestal of being the one, being the error corrector and all of that. And just to chip this in, because some of you send me messages and say that Eva Davina is my sponsor, while on the other hand, some people say that I have a bias about Eva Davina. You don't know nothing about this platform. You know nothing about me. Okay? So, when I speak, I face issues. We don't have favorites here. So, for whatever camp, of course, you belong to, just make sure whatever you get to address in the comments, you are facing the fact of what I'm talking about. Ebel Damina also has his errors as well. Ah! And I, I am addressing one of them today. So listen to him here. These tight mongers can go to any extent. Even if they have to burn the Bible, they will burn it so that nobody will touch their tight. But too late for them. People's eyes are opening all over the world. <laughs> Woo! In my lifetime, if you don't preach Christ, you'll be afraid of the pulpit. Is it already happening? Friends in America. I was sitting with mama in a conference in US of A. We attended a few sessions and we were enjoying the conference. Until that man of God, while teaching one of the evening sessions, at a point he just said, don't touch the tithe don't touch the tithe then he walked a few steps he said you know the fall of adam was that he ate the tithe what inside that that church i didn't know when i said what <laughs> mama did me like this i said wait did you hear that I said, this is the last time we shall come to this place. What? The fall of man is that he ate the tithe. That's an insult on the work of redemption. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. Sin, a rejection of Christ. Sin is to reject the gospel. Man didn't fall by any tithe. Man fell by rejecting God's offer of, of his plan, his salvation. And that's why Jesus had to die to reconcile fallen man back to God. Why are you talking about tithe? 
Is Mammon dealing with you that serious? That you reduce the entire plan of God's redemption, the death of Christ, three days, three nights, the resurrection power to Mammon, Mammon. We have work to do. Did you hear what I said? We have a lot of work. We have to clear all those rubbish out. And make Jesus known. All over the nations of the earth. That the fall of Adam. Was that he ate the tithe. What? I hope so you never tire. Because we still have a long way to go. Not like too long anyway. You can see the timestamp. Okay so some of you remember when Joshua Selman said this about ministers of god when we looked at the whole video of kenneth hagin let me play it for you so you really on get this particular part because you see what ever damina said here he said you to the s of a most of these things there's a place we learn it from let me play that part of joshua sermon for you ah come on jojo this is we're going to finish you for comments now okay when god called samuel samuel ran to eli and said did you call me he went back again and God called him and, and Samuel said, I know what is happening. The next time he speaks, it is through my voice, the semblance of my voice, but I know the one speaking. Tell him, speak, Lord. Because you will hear something that I cannot tell you, even though it is my voice. Are we together now? Yes. This is very powerful. What happens is that God would call a man and through the sacrifice of covenant alignment, God will lead that man through a unique path in the spirit. Listen carefully. A unique path in the spirit that will give that man the capacity to be able to host the dimension of God that he wants to invest in him. Now, when that man successfully goes through that season, God will anoint him and grant him the engracing and the reward of that man for staying with God is that anyone within that dispensation who wants to access that dimension of God will never do it in dishonor to that vessel. That is your own reward for staying with God. That means God will never bypass you to communicate that dimension across that for as long as you are alive. So for instance... When you talk today about the ministry of faith, choose any man of God on earth that you want to. It will still end in Copeland. You listen to Kenneth Copeland, and he may be very simple and basic, but you will be surprised. Ignore his ministry and downplay him through dishonor. You will be surprised that as yielded you are in, as in the spirit, you will never access certain levels of faith until you recognize that ministry as being a conduit, that is the conduit that God set up to administer his dimension of faith. When Kenneth Copeland dies, God will raise another man again. Are we together now? This is very powerful. The ministry of healing, choose any man of God you know that works in the healing ministry. You will keep routing it. It will get back to Benihim standing today. You will never truly walk in the healing anointing, ignoring the presence of that ministry. Are you getting what I'm telling you now? I'm just teaching you how the three layers of God's anointing, that you can have that anointing through encounters, through the manifestation of principles and covenant alignment to people who have that anointing based on covenant. Okay, so that makes sense. So while I respect whatever Damina has said correctly, and like I said before, he was like some pastors who say part of that Pentecostal voodooism. So he knows these particular messages as well. He's been there. It's not as if Pastor David Ibiyo, maybe Pastor David Ibiyo may read the book of that person or maybe watch a video of that person that ever Damina knows. So it's okay when you see the same thing being preached. So Hallelujah. Now, thank you, Lord. His tithe is where he got in trouble. He ate something that was not his. It belonged to God. His first act was disobedience. His second act, once he became disobedient, was 
thievery. That didn't belong to him. He didn't have any business eating it. He stole it. Even though he had a whole garden full of stuff, he ate off this. Well, yeah, but Brother Copeland, he really didn't mean it. Yeah, he did. The Word said that his wife was deceived, but he wasn't. He went into it with his eyes wide open. So, here he is now. He was supposed to have worked, tilled, guarded, and exercised his faith and effort over that tree, just like all the other trees, but the fruit off of that tree belonged to God. He never got far enough to know how to do that. But God didn't leave him in that lurch. He must have taught him because we see later his two sons knew about it. Huh? Abel got into trouble over it just like his daddy did. And it led him into a place of serious crime. The first murder was over the tithe. The first sin was over the tithe. So there's something there. There's something about that tithe that's more than just a religious exercise. There's, there's something happening here that, that God's very specific about. It's there's something happened here that the devil does not want taking place if he can stop it. There's something really going on here. There's more to it than just dividing your paycheck by 10% and putting it in the bucket. So, Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the fact that he came and got it back. <laughs> Hallelujah. But here God was the first one. But now after that, he had men to take his message. Why? Because he had turned it over to men. So now he is speaking for God. God is saying it again. He blessed him said unto Abram, Be blessed, Abram, of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into your hand, and, has, and he gave him tithes of all. There's that tithing connection. Now I want you to notice what it's connected to. When he got into Melchizedek's presence, Melchizedek, king of Salem, said, See, it was, it was God saying, he's the priest of God. He's anointed to say it. He said, blessed be Abram of God, possessor of heaven and earth. How do you think that hit Abram's ear? <laughs> Who, me? <laughs> Possessor of heaven and earth? Well, certainly he's getting it piece at a time, piece at a time. He had it working in him and working on him. Praise God. He's got a covenant with God. God said, I'll bless you. I'll bless those that bless you and I'll curse those that curse you. I will be your rear guard. I will work with you, son. I'm the best thing that ever happened to you. And then here comes this priest with the elements of the covenant. Now, what do you think he did with that bread and wine? He ministered. There's an exchange going on here. This man brought his tithe, which is what his great, 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 ten times great grandfather should have done in the garden. He never got the chance. He ate of it before he ever took it to God. He... He took the tithe. How's he going to take it to God? He took it to God's priest who had the authority to receive it. And as he received and as he drank of that cup and he ate of that bread, indicating he is in covenant with God, that priest said, can you imagine him with the cup in his hand now? 
that priest is handing that man that cup and said, Blessed be Abram of God, you possessor of heaven and earth. And we see it in the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. He's heir of the world. Why? He believed what Melchizedek said to him. Now, I want you to look at this now. Abram, and just right out there. And he gave him tithes of all. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, Give me the persons, blah, blah, blah. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth. I'll not take from you one thread of your sh shoes. I'll take anything except what my men ate in the field. Lest somebody said, you made Abraham rich. One translation said, let it never be said any man made Abraham rich, but almighty God. Now in his mind, it's what's roaring in his ears, in his mind. It, he's just heard, he has just taken communion and the priest of the Most High God has called him possessor of heaven and earth. He is of God. He's in covenant with God who is possessor of heaven and earth. The blessing is roaring on him. It's roaring on him. It's in his ears. And here comes this, here, here comes this weirdo that wants to make a deal with him. A financial deal. And he said, no! Amen. And in his mind, he's thinking, ha, 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 I'm richer than I've ever been. The whole earth, somehow or other, is mine. What do I want with your monkey business? Amen. Can you see when it happened? It didn't happen in Sunday school. It didn't happen in a church service. It didn't happen while he was out riding a horse or a camel somewhere. It didn't happen while he was uh, herding a flock. It happened while he was tithing. That's it, Brother Minano. So it's okay when you see the same thing being preached. The origin of tithe is the Garden of Eden. Adam got into trouble with God because he ate tithe. God gave Adam all the trees of the garden. Then he says, one of them belongs to me. Don't touch it. This is the tithe. The temptation of the devil to Eve was eat tithe. That temptation is still happening to you right now. And you are falling down every day. That's why sometimes if you see me in the comments giving people what to go to, just let me be. Do you, are you getting the point now? Because you see someone, of course, in the comments now, still trying to defend this. But you have Bible there with you. This people, is, he's not the only one that is preaching the same thing. Oh, don't, don't, let me show you another person. God, the Bible says God placed man in the garden of Eden to work it and to tend it. I had another preacher in Africa here, close to us here. He said, you know, the fall of Adam is he ate the tithe. And God said to man, I've created all things, giving it unto you. There is one thing, the fruit of the tree of good and evil, which is the tithe. Eh, which tithe? and fell by the tide then it means salvation will be by the tide then there's no need for jesus to die so you can keep you can keep the 90 do whatever you please with the 90 but the tenth is mine and even that man says no i want the 90 including god's ten. why are you talking about tithe is mammon dealing with you that serious that you reduce the entire plan of God's redemption, the death of Christ, three days, three nights, the resurrection power to mammon, mammon. God came from eternity into time. So I understand why the media people of uh, Ebo Damina um, use that particular video to counter it or something. It's not as if Ebo Damina came out and spoke 
publicly against uh, um, Ibiyome recently. But of course, there's a video that counters that, so that can be used as well for a good marriage as well to discuss that. But of course, if you know tithing, of course, for a fact of what it is, what I will tell you for a fact is that what we practice today as tithing is just selective. None of your pastors of today is a Levite. At least I think if you want to really follow giving of course i should be as it should be in the church it should be according to the, the footprint we see the template of the apostles in the bible and how the church itself was actually run by collections by contributions and cheerful giving but when we want to dip our hands into the laws well at least we should follow you to the latter so maybe you could search this of course in scripture the tithe of course the sacred the levi sacred tithe is in numbers 18 from verse 21 to 24 then the tithe of the feast would be in deuteronomy 14 verse 22 to 27 and then the tithe for the poor would be in deuteronomy 14 verse 28 to 29 as well so you really get to understand where i'm getting my ideologies from but again so let's look at Pastor about Damina here because some of you always say if I say about Damina is wrong, it's as if people want to start tumbling on your bed. See, nobody himself as well is absolute in whatever. Deborah Damina is not a commander in chief of correction and then custodian of all doctrines and this. He also makes blunders, serious blunders that are foundational, of course, to the faith. And this is what Deborah Damina said in a video about the Garden of Eden. Listen to him here. Should God have put the tree if he loved man? There was no tree in Eden. Those was Moses' way of explaining what he saw in the vision. It wasn't a tree. That's why Jesus would say in Mark, Are you also without understanding? Don't you know that what a man eats does not defile him? Because what he eats will go out through the toilet. Don't forget to but what defiles a man is what comes from within the man. Thoughts. For out from within the man proceed evil thoughts. And then Paul will now explain what happened in Eden by revelation knowledge in Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered, is a Greek word, esokomai. It means a foreign object was introduced into the world and death by sin. All right, so Adam sinned against God by rejecting God's offer of life in Christ Jesus. It was not something that was eating. It was man making a choice not to accept God's offer of life in Christ Jesus. It is called unbelief in Hebrews chapter 3. Now, while that might sound very scriptural, oh, Rema, and he gets to quote scriptures in Hebrews and then talks about Paul and talks about Jesus, what he said there is wrong. And I'm going to discuss about it. Now, if you say that, that, if you say that the tree itself is symbolic that there was no tree in the Garden of Eden, come on, where, did you, where do you even get that from? Note this as well. Let's, let's look at scripture because, you see, we need to really sometimes be very careful as for the things we really take hook, line, and sinker, especially from those we hold on to to a high esteem. Let's look at Genesis 3. So let's look at Genesis here 2. Let's look at uh, Genesis 2 from verse 8 to 9. Then the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground. Trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So you see one thing, just like how the scripture says, I placed before you light, I prayed before you life and death, but I want you to choose life. You see, in people always we always look talk about the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but we never remember to talk about the tree of life itself. The tree of life was there for a purpose. Why would they have the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil at the same spot, but they chose to go for the tree of knowledge of good and evil, at least being deceived, of course, by the serpent? Not even minding what Ebed Amina is saying as well, trying to connote scripture, trying to connote it with what Jesus was talking about. I think I discovered that particular scripture when we were looking at the subject of when Ebed Amina said you should continue watching porn and then watch message one hour, this and this. And I was trying to look at the concept of sin itself. I created a good balance as well when we look at that particular scripture where Jesus was talking about. It's not that which comes out in that defiles you or goes through your mouth, but that which comes out of you. So Ebed Amina combining that and saying that, oh, it's not what you eat that defiles you. So with that as well, he tries to make it look like whatever happened with the whole fruit thing and all that didn't actually happen because of what Jesus said. Ah, be coming down. Because if you are saying so, that means even the tree of life as well is fiction does not exist oh yes as well but you see if the tree of life itself did not exist why would 
in why would in Genesis 3 why would in Genesis 3 verse 20 here going down then the man Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live and the Lord God made clothing from animal skin for Adam and his wife then the Lord said verse 22 look the human beings have become like us knowing both good and evil from the tree that they have eaten what if they reach out what if they reach out and take what if they reach out what if they reach out take fruit from the tree of life and eat it they will live forever so the lord god banished them from the garden of eden and then sent adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made wait a minute is that also fiction so if you say the tree if you said there were no trees in the garden what does the tree of life itself represent now i know that it's always it's going to be like it looking at the person of jesus so when you look at what he even says because what he said would be tautology in a sense if you say that there was no tree like that in the garden that it was just what moses was you know how he understood the revelation that he was writing then that means what he's saying to be what he's saying to be the reason for Adam's for looking at the person of Jesus Christ would not even make sense at all. Before I get to explain why, where in the Bible does that particular statement Abel Lamina made come from? It was not something that was eating. It was man making a choice not to accept God's offer of life in Christ Jesus. It is called unbelief in Hebrews chapter three. That. Adam sinned by rejecting God's offer of a life by Christ Jesus. When he is actually the second Adam, I mean Christ himself being the second Adam. Think about that for a moment. Now, even though we understand that even before the foundation of this world, God knew the plan for salvation, the plan for Jesus, of course, had been in place. You have to understand that salvation itself is the remedy for Adam's disobedience and not Adam rejecting salvation. If you are talking about Adam rejecting Jesus Christ or the offer of Christ. That means Adam had to be in a state already, either a sinful state or a cursed state for him to actually be rejecting the offer of Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying here? But was Adam in that state at that time? So even, so even if Jesus was in the plan of God before the foundations of this world, at that time in the garden, it was not in effect. So we don't try to say, oh, because we have revelation knowledge, you now have to backdate it and just try to superimpose it just anywhere. No, in the end, you now make the whole thing more like a mess. Yes, of course, the, the scriptures itself is a path, is we understanding God's plan to redeeming man to himself. Of course, it makes sense in that way, but when you try to just, just oppose scriptures like that, it doesn't really get to make sense. But you see, your ideology would make sense if Jesus is being seen as the tree of life. You know, we understand Jesus to be the bread of life, the water of life. Jesus is not represented in scripture as the tree of life. Now at this point, just in case you want to quote Jesus being called the vine, or maybe sometimes as well people see Jesus as a tree of life looking at the cross that he hung on the tree. Either way, I'm just talking about the fact that categorically stating Jesus as the tree of life is not explicit in scripture, even though you can infer from it as well um, being the true vine. So just for you to get the context of what I'm saying. But we can see it to be that him being the life giver and then him being the reason why we have eternal life, it makes sense why he can be seen to be a representation of the tree of life but now you are saying that there were no trees there so what then are you now having so that then that means if i try to defend your statement on that particular ground it still doesn't hold ground it still doesn't hold any water why because you have said that there were no trees there but adam saying even though scriptures clearly state that he wasn't the one that was deceived but he was the one that had the authority he was the one that was given the instruction before the creation of the woman him being discussed here even though you see pastor ibiyomi himself discussing um him as a subject it's important as well for us to know that I believe, except you still disbelieve, that indeed what the scripture itself says literally is exactly what it is. And if you think that the trees itself did not exist, it was just nothing. How can the beginning of scripture be talking about the tree of life itself, at least? And even when you go towards the end of scripture, it still talks about the tree of life. Let's go to Revelation, the last chapter of scripture. Revelation. Revelation 22, right here from verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of a city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Wait a minute. This also right here is fiction. Let me read another one again. Just, so if you look at, so you could tell me which of them is more like a weightier matter. 
the Pastor David Ibiome comparing what happened in the Garden of Eden to Titan as that being the reason for the fall of man. And then that means tithing of also ties to your salvation. It's not different from what maybe Pastor Iya Deboye was saying years ago about if you don't tithe, you'll go to hell. That kind of thing, because in a way they have to, to order, in order to enforce that particular legalism, of course, on people, you have to get them at their core of where they can actually be held onto. So if you imagine you are saying that the first man that was created, if I'm to put it that way, is failed because of tithing. And the world is in the way it is right now today because our first parents refused to tithe. Because the first man refused to tithe. You can now imagine how it deep, it's deep that you will say, oh, no, I don't want to be like Adam. I want to tithe. I don't know if you get the point. But I think Eber Damina did justice as well on that as well, looking at that particular aspect. And I had to just look at the other aspect as well Eber Damina said about um, the, the Garden of Eden. Again, so okay. Hebrews 3 that he mentioned, just to add this as well, Hebrews 3 that I brought Damina mentioned, if you look at it in context, it's looking at Moses and the Israelites and how their unbelief, of course, led to their wandering. And I think we looked at that when we, when we were t looking at the subject of, you know, the man that was healed at the pool of Bethesda, when we were trying to connect it as well there with, you know, the unbelief, of course, of the people looking at his age and then how long the people actually spent in the wilderness and all of that. So what point am I trying to make here as well? If you, if you also want to look at it in Hebrews 2 verse 2, I think as well, looking at the subject of unbelief, what's that statement he made there with respect to Adam and then Jesus Christ as well in the Garden of Eden? None found there as well. That is not in Scripture. But if you are trying to now look at it that, okay, it's not whatever the fruit that was eaten, because now you are trying to say that nothing was eaten. It was where that particular statement is it in scripture where are you getting it from he was given an instruction you understand don't eat of this so how did sin itself come into the world through one man sin came into the world so what is sin itself sin itself is disobedience to god do you understand so he is looking at eating of a tree as being non-existent that means even the instruction that was given by god as well is also non-existent but the whole idea as well is about the disobedience. I think I like the way Crefo Dollar put it here in this particular context. Adam and Eve sinned. It wasn't the eating of the fruit, but refusing to believe in the goodness of God. Genesis 3 and 5. We keep saying that sin came because they ate the, the fruit. And then we call it an apple. What you going to call it? Watermelon apple? Well, how? We keep just adding more fantasy to it. But that's not what happened. The sin wasn't the eating of the fruit. The sin was refusing all of the other trees that God said was yours, and you refused to believe the goodness of God and zeroed in on a one fruit tree when you had every tree in the garden. And the same thing is true today. You zero in on one little traditional legalistic thing when God says, all my goodness is yours. All my glory is yours. I give you my name. Man, I hope you understand, I am not against the tithe. I believe that, again, it was in effect before the law was given. It's still in effect after the law is given, but the motive is changed. If, if people gave 10% under the old covenant, we have such a better covenant. Jesus has done so much more for us than what any blood of any animal has ever done for us, that, man, if 10% was the standard under the old covenant, I believe it ought to be more than that under the new covenant. But I would say that that's a minimum that people ought to be giving. So I'm not against the tithe even under the new covenant, but I'm against it under the motivation of Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Jesus fulfilled this for us. We are not under the law anymore, and this curse that was placed upon people for not paying tithes and offerings has been placed upon Jesus, and we're now redeemed from that curse. In fact, I told God, maybe my time is up. Because there was no more joy, no excitement. I'm not looking forward to anything. I was fed up. I said to God, is this all that there is to ministry? Preach, 
raise money and be happy. Is that all? Collect money, raise money, promise people things that I know is not Bible. Four keys to success, three keys to breakthrough, 45 keys, 40 steps, how to make it, pillars of prosperity. And I know that none of them is true. I even knew that some of the scriptures I was quoting, there was something wrong with them. Scriptures like give and it shall be given. Good measure, praise thou shall give together, running over, shall men give to your bosom. Has nothing to do with money. I got fed up and I left church. I left our church. I didn't tell them, but I left. I told mama, let's get out. We jetted out. I was fed up. I said, let me pray. Maybe I need to pray. Maybe something is wrong with me. I need to seek the Lord and find out what is the matter. I got into prayer. I took two weeks to pray. At the end of two weeks of praying, I had nothing. But I felt like going to the bookshop. I got to the bookshop. And I saw a shelf with Andrew Womack's book. I never liked Andrew Womack because to me, he is a lazy preacher. You know, Africans, until somebody is gyrating, he is playing. So, and then the woman could just sit down and be talking as if the whole world is waiting for him. <laughs> I didn't like him. But then I discovered he, he commanded global attention. So I wanted to find out what is he saying that makes everywhere I go, people are asking me if I'm listening to Andrew Womack. But I'm not patient to watch him. So I saw a shelf of all his books. I packed all. But I didn't need. We came back to Uyo. I got on my pulpit and preached and felt emptier. I told Mama, let's go again. We left. We went to Dubai. In Dubai, I prayed for like two weeks. I was just seeking myself. I was looking for me. Because me was lost. Listen to me, I'm not joking. Me was lost. I had cars. I had money. I had invite, I could preach on any pulpit in the world I wanted. I had everything working, but me was lost. So I traveled. After two weeks in Dubai, I didn't find solution. I told Mama, let's go back. We got in the aircraft. On that trip, I took two of Andrew Womack's book, and I didn't read them. But in the plane, my eyes were sharp, so I felt like reading. So I took the first Andrew Womack's book. I read only eight pages. Eight. And my heart opened. The veils fell off. I saw where I missed it. I took out a notebook and my pen. And I was writing throughout the flight. I finished the first book, the second book that I took with me. I came back and proceeded on another time of vacation. I studied, studied, prayed. I began to find joy fulfillment in Christ in Christ I discovered that mm -mm, Christ is the missing link in the gospel and the only link in the gospel so is the disobedience itself that defiled him do you understand that's why the fruit itself you see like um, Pastor David BMA was saying that's why the fruit is not mentioned because tomorrow now you will say, you know, if you eat of this fruit, this is the fruit that Adam ate or something. You know, that's where you see Pastor Ibiyome himself is correct there. It's not like it's apple, just that apple is, has been the depiction, of course, over time. Because had it been the fruit itself was mentioned, hey, what will happen? Everybody as well will say that uh, this fruit, to, ah, this fruit is from Garden of Eden, know, this and that. That's why the fruit itself is not mentioned. So, Ebed Amina himself saying that it's pure fiction is more, is more symbolic as well. That means even the instruction that was given by God himself is symbolic. And God himself did not give the instruction like he was actually portraying in his reason for the fall of Adam being the rejection of the offer of Christ. Doesn't make sense. So you see the point of what I'm trying to make here? But again, that's how all of these theological jamborines as well gets to confuse us um, in the body of Christ. But of course, that is what I think in this particular conversation. You could have your rebuttals in the comment. It's a community. That is what I think. You may not agree with me. Of course, I do know that. But of course, if I disagree with you, I'm the one making the video. Probably you can make a video to disagree with me. It happens a lot. Just make sure your rebuttals are facts over sentiment. I've spoken my facts. And that's also what I believe in as well. Till I see you next time, stay blessed. <laughs>